Make sure that it's mixed. If anybody wants to fill this, they're welcome to. I am. This has got a little bit of sediment at the bottom, but that's it. The whole gallon's now all mixed. So just that. What you want to do is you want to hold a long wooden spoon in your gallon of porcelain, and this works for all grains, not just mine. When you let go of that spoon, if you can count 1,003 before it pops out of the porcelain, two things. We're about 1,006. So we're in about six seconds. So what I do, and I'm not going to do it for this, but what I do is teaspoon of salt, maybe, add it to it, mix it up, try it again. Usually by the time you reach maybe a third teaspoon of water, it'll pop it up. Your porcelain is still thick enough that you can pour with it. <coughs> and it's not too thin, but the buoyancy is perfect. You will have no liquid memory. And that's all you need is a wooden spoon. The other thing you have to keep in mind though, as you are pouring throughout the day, if you're having a hot summer like you did last summer, add a little bit of water, check it, like, if I'm pouring on a hot day like that, I will take everything that I'm using and put it back in the big container, hour later, hour and a half later, and test it again. Because usually what happens is some of the water that's in there that you added for that buoyancy has now evaporated because of the heat surrounding it. And you could accidentally cause that liquid memory if you don't double check it. So I just pour it all back in there and, oh, no, it's a little thick, add, Teaspoon, half a teaspoon of water, mix it up, and all of a sudden, just like that, it's the right thing. So anybody that wants to fill this, you're welcome to. You can see that so about thousand four. So I would not add any more than maybe a tablespoon of water to this. Once you add that tablespoon and mix it up, it'll pop right up. I do and I don't. That's a good answer. It depends on what I'm doing. Technically, you can if you're doing things like figurines, you know, things like that. If you're doing a doll that you have a pattern for that is fit for that doll, then no, don't do it. It's not the fact that you're going to make bad porcelain by reclaiming it. You're going to change the shrink. Reclaimed porcelain shrinks about 18 to 21 percent versus the 16 to 17 percent of regular porcelain. So if you're pouring something that you want to be smaller, save all your pieces, put them in a bucket, let them dry out, cover it with water. You'll see, you know, until the water's above it, let it sit overnight. The porcelain will reclaim itself. It'll absorb all the water it possibly can and then it'll stop. The next morning you'll see a water flow. Pour the water float off, mix it up, and you have reclaimed porcelain that is just as castable as new, but it'll shrink 21% if you want something smaller. So when I'm shrinking down a BJD from one size to the next, I make sure. Okay, if we take our 17 inch doll and I pour it in porcelain and fire it, will it be the right size to use that body as a basis for the 13 inch? Mm -hmm. Not quite. But if I pour her in reclaimed porcelain, yes, that's how we do it. Because if we would have poured her twice, we would have missed that area in there and she would have been too small. So we figured out mathematically that by using reclaimed porcelain, So if you've got a chair or a, you know, an animal that you're using as an accessory or something for a doll that's a little bit too big and you want it a little bit smaller, this is a porcelain, it'll be smaller. And you don't have to add any other porcelain to it, you can just right. three no. times. Uh, if you're not, if you want it to be fairly close to the same shrinking, and like I said, you're not worried about a doll, if you've got patterns to fit with something else, Use 75% new porcelain to 25% reclaim. You can mix the two together and you'll see about a half of a percentage difference. And that's all you're going to see.
it's enough in something like a doll pattern where the clothes have to fit perfect that you're gonna have to do some minor adjustments. But for other things, I always tell people, you know, I would rather you throw it all away and buy more porcelain. That's more money in my pocket. But I would rather, in this economy especially, that you all learn how to be conservative and use what you got. You know, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. So does anybody have any questions about all of this? I noticed none of you went yawn, yawn, yawn. <laughs> yeah? If you put, say, three shoulder plates, you're going to reclaim it. Is How much water, how big a vessel do you put them in? Because, I mean, you couldn't put it when in you crumble the bucket. Up. Yeah, crumble them up when they're dry. Yeah. Yeah, crumble the whole thing up and just whatever container will hold it. So the more you've got, the bigger the container. Right. Right. So if it's only one shoulder plate, it's silly, uh, just as an example. Yeah. You would only have just a dish. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And just a big enough container that you can cover the reclaim and about a quarter of an inch above it. So that all of that is in the water. Mm -hmm. now, a lot of people misunderstand me when I talk about reclaim. And I'll ask them if they reclaim and they say, oh yeah, I do that all the time. I take my spare off the collar and throw it back in the gallery. Yeah. Yeah. Never, ever, ever do that. Because you will off balance the new porcelain you're throwing that collar into. And that sounds strange that a collar thrown into it will throw it off where the reclaimed porcelain won't. But the collar you're throwing into there is not dry. And that's the difference. It's going to throw off that yellow porcelain by doing that. Tony, what sort of water should it be? Distilled water, rainwater? I use normal tap water, but it depends, you know, in the United States, for example, if you're, they're living out in the country and they're using well water, they try not to because they're afraid of the impurities and they use distilled water. You know, it's, you remember the old expression when we were kids that you could listen to Rice Krispies? You know, you step, crack a pop, step, crack a pop. Your reclaimed horse will do exactly the same thing. So don't be shocked when you hear that. But you cover it with water and you're going to hear beep, 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 because it is literally going to absorb as much water as it can, as fast as it can, and then it stops. And that's what causes the water flow. And it's really kind of fun, a lot of times when I'm doing casting classes, we do that on purpose so they can hear that. But one of these times, maybe they'll come back and we'll do a casting class. We do a lot, of, you can do so much with porcelain that people are not aware of. We do double and triple pouring, for example where we take a vase and pour it in white porcelain, count to 10, dump it out. You wait about a half an hour and pour it green, dump it out. You wait about another half hour and pour it in pink. Then we draw a rose pattern on the outside and you carve through the rose pattern and the pink and green show through. There's a lot of things. We have a product called Stuff. If you want something to be marble, take any color of our porcelain Mix it with stuff. You can do the same thing by adding it to bell porcelain or adding it to ceiling porcelain. It'll change the buoyancy. You then use like a four cup pitcher, fill it with your white porcelain. The porcelain that you have thickened with the stuff will float on top. You mix it up just like you would be to marbleize a cake. And you pour it inside your mold and it will swirl around there. When you get that piece out of the mold, it looks like it's made out of marble. So there's lots of things that you can do with porcelain that a lot of people are not aware of. Uh, our porcelain is so stable, I was telling one of the ladies when she was over here in the workshop, oh, I think it was Veronica. Yeah. Silk flowers that you buy at the store that have the plastic on the back and the whole bit, don't even take the plastic off. Turn the flower upside down, grab that plastic with a pair of tweezers, dip it down inside porcelain that's been thinned a little bit, pink porcelain, blue porcelain, whatever you dip it in, it can be a bright red silk flower. You dip it down inside of pink porcelain, shake it off, do that a second time, turn it over and set it on top of a piece of greenware. When it fires, the silk and the plastic burns away and you have an exact duplicate of that silk flower. So you can do fun things. We teach classes where we take little jewelry boxes and everybody has a little bucket of pink and yellow and green and blue and we dip all these silk flowers and we put them all on there and they're fired and it looks like you spent weeks hand building all of these flowers.
It's a fun class for senior complexes and things like that because it is so easy and so much fun. So no other questions, huh? Okay, then I guess we're done. We'll take them up. Do you have anything online, a website, or that can explain some of these? Yeah, we've got a lot of techniques online and I'm constantly adding them. If you go to our website and go to the free download section, a lot of this stuff's in the free download section. I don't know why you do. I really don't. I, the only thing I can figure is it's because of whoever manufactured the kilns. Because a lot of the kilns that we use, both here and in Europe and in the U.S., will actually go to a cone tin. But that's the max kiln. You know, if they would have built them to go to a cone 12, then we could safely fire to a 12 without totally destroying that kiln. If you're taking a kiln to the max, every single firing, you fire porcelain every day for two years, the kiln's gonna be gone, you're gonna have to buy a new kiln. So for some reason, they built kilns that fired to a cone 10 and then chose to lower it down to a cone six porcelain. I, like I said, I've been, a clay engineer for 38 years, and I have never had anybody that could answer that question as to why did we do that. Since we have a little bit of time, I'll give you guys a little basis of chime paint and how chime paint is made. Has anybody ever studied color? If you study color, nine times out of ten, if it's a good professor, they will use a flame as a teaching tool. Because color in our industry, whether it's an endo that's sitting on top, which underlays the people don't know the term endo, or it's a china paint. It's all done through minerals. Cobalt, for example, if you look at a flame in a fireplace, is the blue part of the flame. Cobalt fires blue. Now there is a black cobalt. There's cobalt that in some areas of the world is actually purple in its powder form, and they will fire two different shades of blue. If you want green, it's chrome. The green part of the flame is chrome. The brown part of the flame is nickel. The basic color of China paint that we all started with in dolls is pompadour. I'm sure you've all heard that term. Pompadour is made of four different iron. When you study antique dolls and you know that some of them are more of a yellow red that you put on the cheeks or the lips, some are more of a pink red, some are more of a brown red, it's because of which iron <coughs> they use. Because iron can be yellow iron, red iron, or black iron, or combinations thereof. In the late 1980s, our industry got hit with the lead spare. You know, what they were finding out was that they were putting lead in house paint and babies were chewing on cribs and getting sick and worldwide, there was a spare. Why they ever came after the doll industry, I don't know. Because we don't eat dolls. <laughs> but they did. The industry they really wanted to target was the china painting industry itself. And what was happening is the china painters were not firing their plates hot enough. And it's, if they didn't use them strictly as decoration and they fired a platter, and I'm gonna give it to grandma, and grandma makes spaghetti every Sunday, the acid that's in that spaghetti will bleach the lead out. And that's what triggered it with the industry. 
So then they decided, okay, we're going to have to figure out something to replace the lead. I don't know about you, but most of the lead, leadless paints that hit the market are horrible. Mm -hmm. The reason why is they decided to go from lead to lithium. And lithium does not fire well. All they had to do was wait about 10 years and recommission the industry for approval to use lead in our paint. That's what we do. Our paints are lead-based paints. People such as Gail tell me stories of the first time I used your paints, I'm so used to the paints fading that I put it on three times as darkened. <laughs> Shit, it didn't fade. Now what do I do? <laughs> because ours are much, much stronger. Because we refile the permission to use lead in our paints. The other thing you'll find with our paints, has anybody played with pinks and purples? Mm -hmm. yeah. They're horrible. <laughs> Especially if you're painting on a glazed surface. And that is the goal of it. Gold drags. Trying to blush pink on a china plate is a Almost impossible, as we, you all know. What I discovered about five years ago is that if I add 10% silver, it stops that. Any of you that want to come by the sales table and play, you're welcome to. We brought all of our pinks and purples with us. You can ask the ladies that did the oval plate. They are absolutely spectacular. We've got four ovals over there that are already fired, and they are pink, pink, pink when we're fired. Speaking of which, the ladies that did the oil, there's a couple of you here. Um, sometime this afternoon, if you want to, we can sit over there and be real quiet while the guys are lecturing, and you can apply the second coat to rouge the cheeks and that kind of stuff, and Leslie will fire again so you'll be able to take them home done. So we can do that too. That's, that's the history of what happened with China Paint. Unfortunately, the other manufacturers have never gone back to the authorities and said, please, could we have permission to use lead? So there's still an awful lot of lead-free China paints out there. I do have to admit, we have one. The only lead-free in our line is called Black Diamond. And it is what the antique doll people absolutely, I, I swear, I think they drink it, <laughs> use for the lashes and the eyes. Because it is the blackest, purest black have ever seen, and I accidentally managed to get it, and it's lead free. Why did and you make we it lead sell free, so much of it. Huh? Why did you make it lead free? I was playing, I was just experimenting to see if I could get one because most of the blacks that are lead free fire green, they have a green color or a gray cast to them. And what black is created <coughs> is all colors in the spectrum create black. And if you don't get the cobalt, chrome, nickel, iron exactly correct, you've got too much chrome in it, your black's going to have green cast. If you put too much iron in it, it's going to have a red cast. And you really have to be careful. So I was playing and I thought, okay, our regular ink drop is a really cool black, works really well. But I thought, I wonder if I could get it a little darker black. And the reason being, lead bleaches black. And I thought, let me give it a shot. Let me see if I can do it lead-free and get a black. And it's about three times as black as our lead as well. And I mean, the antique doll industry, we have one lady named uh, Leslie Bradley in South Africa that every other month buys 24 bottles. <laughs> I mean, I swear, I think her students are drinking. <laughs> but she absolutely sparks my friends. And... Color alone is a lot of fun. 